Investing with IBD is brought to you by Alliance Bernstein, a global investment manager offering active, flexible solutions across asset classes. ABS the tools and expertise investors need to get their portfolios ready to navigate late cycle investing. To find out more, visit abfunds.com. Okay, hello and welcome everyone to Investing with IBD for May 8th, 2019. I'm your host, Arusha Pierce. And returning back to the studio, smiling as always, is Chris Gessel, Chief Content Officer of IBD. Welcome back. Glad to be back. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about the markets, how we take profits, and, you know, these markets have been a nice little reminder yeah. of why we take profits. And then we're going to end the podcast with an interview from our sponsor, uh, Alliance Bernstein, that's hosted by Randy Watts. And he's going to speak with Alliance Bernstein market strategist Rick Brink about investing strategies for later in the cycle. So, Chris, let's get in the market. The market's under pressure. Four distribution days on the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. Yeah, I don't know if today was a di distribution day. but As of yesterday, um, I think it changed the day, but uh, I was busy around the close. So, But, you know, yes, the market's under pressure. Pretty obvious because... Uh, on Friday, it seemed like everything was great. The market was working right. There were all sorts of setups. There were things starting to break out, especially with the IPOs. Yes. And then, bam, we're back to it's it's uh, time for tweets. Uh, and so over the weekend, we get tweets that now the trade war is back on and, and the rhetoric is kind of pitched, talking about raising tariffs on, on even more uh, goods. So that really caught the market by surprise. And Monday, I, how, how did how did the Monday's open feel to you? I didn't want to get up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, I didn't want to look at the futures on, on Monday because I looked at them on Sunday night. I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. Here we go again. Right. Well, um, uh, I took the day off, but. Uh, Smart. Did you go for a hike? No, I didn't go for a hike. I went to a concert in San Diego, which was a lot of fun. Nice. But. Uh, I was at a friend's house, got up, you know, uh, fired up the computer and just kind of sat there for a few minutes. And a good thing because, you know, really from the the opening tick, the market started uh, rallying back. Right, so right. that was great. And even by the close, uh, I, don't, I don't know how you were doing, but I was up in my account and I was like, I could not believe it. That was a huge swing, like a 3% yeah. swing from low to high and you know, like, wow, okay, maybe this isn't a big deal. Then Tuesday, uh, that's what we got it, you know. Yeah. We got what the market really wanted to give us on Monday. It, it's true. And and what was funny on Monday is with the way it closed and we all kind of survived Monday, we all were kind of happy, right? It's like, oh, right, wow, right, we survived yeah. that. This market's so resilient. I'm so glad I didn't, you know, I didn't sell everything or whatever. And then Tuesday's like, hold my beer. <laughs> well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the I, I guess the best part of today, even though the market faded at the close and was uh, down a little bit, we didn't have another big sell-off. And right. so if we had had another big sell-off, to me, that would have been indicative of, okay, maybe a correction starting. It would have looked a lot like how the market was in October. And when you get, you know, uh, really violent sell-offs, uh, you know, uh, like two or three days in a row, that's often how uh, a correction starts. So today, since it was an inside day, down just a little bit, it had been up. Leaders were acting pretty well. Um, I think. I think that's the key. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The number of them, they they came down to support. They they held, uh, and we still have a chance. Yeah. And when I when I, and that's kind of how I look at it. On the weekly charts, actually, a lot a lot of stocks look pretty constructive still. So the leading stocks haven't taken too much damage. Uh, for this. And so with the volatility, you know, after these three days that, that we've gone through, the, the, the stocks are still looking uh, pretty good. Right. And, and actually, you know, we've had a huge rally off the bottom, I think like 32% from the NASDAQ. And so, you know, we've been at new highs, we're pulling back a little bit. I mean, we, I think some consolidation would be constructive. I, I know that you and I complain about it and we want to be up every day, and if if it is a down day, you know maybe we give back a dollar or two. Right. But uh, you know, I, I to me it seems okay. I guess the biggest risk is still: does this turn into a full blown trade war? 
And maybe the other thing out there that I, I believe I've talked about before is there's a chance that the the damage of the you know trade war so far has sown the seeds of a recession, especially in Europe. They they seem to be uh, the weakest. So that would be, you know, maybe even a deal gets done and then Europe drags everyone else into a recession. But I you know I'm hoping it doesn't happen that way. Well, I I think these last few days have been a good reminder of another aspect of investing. Oh, absolutely. Right. And, and it's, uh, and this is one of the hardest things for me and it, and it's taking profits, right? You're doing so well in these stocks and, uh, and all of a sudden you're up 20% or, or, mm -hmm. or something like that. And it's hard to sell anything, right? Because it could go up a hundred percent. Sure. Well, when the market's going well and you're king of the universe, it's like, and, and, and uh, now you start calculating if I continue to make money at this rate this year, well, and right. then you know you start making all your plans, right. and that's usually the time. That's the top. <laughs> well, <laughs> for your that, for account. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If not the top, it's time to to start rethinking things. And you're right; that's the hardest part. Is uh, the time when you should be taking profits is when you least likely want to take them because everything is looking good, and you've got a stock that broke out and it's up twenty percent. Uh, you know, why, you know, why leave the party right now? However, I think it's, you know, we run into this when the market's weak and the stocks are what off 10% of where they peaked or maybe 15%. And now you're looking like, oh, well, I'll hold it to here. And that 20% gain might end up to be 5%. Or maybe you round trip the whole thing, which is yeah, terrible. done so many times. Right. So let's go into some examples here. The, the first example is Atlassian, ticker mm -hmm. symbol T-E-A-M, so team. And uh, this, this was a stock that broke out of a cup with handle back in early, uh, well, late, really, de de December 20, 31st of 2018. Right. Kind of poked above the buy point right. there. Right, right. But then it, it, really, it, it really started to make progress once we had that fall through day on January 4th. Went up 20%. It actually right. went up a little bit more. But this was one of the, this is one of the stocks that I was in. And you know, this is one of the ones that I actually took some profits in. Uh, now I'm actually, I do, full disclosure, I do have shares of, of this stock again, but, uh, but this is after years of kind of round tripping stocks. Mm -hmm. Now I've got, I've gotten the habit of, okay, let me just take something off. Let me take something. It doesn't always have to be everything, but some partial sell, uh, when you're, when I'm up like 15% or 20%. Yeah. Well, th this stock, it's one that we know they make collaboration software, uh, and so all and we of our, use these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, use, yeah, we use it every, yeah. uh, every day. A lot of us are using Jira and uh, uh, Confluence, Confluence is right. another one. Yeah. So they've got a whole suite of software tools for development for IT and lets them communicate with the stakeholders and the project managers as well as the the actual people doing the uh, the work. So you know, every time you see something coming new on uh, you know either. The website or MarketSmith or Leaderboard, definitely uh, Atlassian Software has, has had a role in that. So we, we definitely know about this company. It has great fundamentals growing at a 40% annualized rate over the last five years. And how many companies do that? Uh, right. Not a lot. I, I wish there were more these days. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we got triple digit earnings growth in the, in the latest quarter. So that is, uh, I mean, it's the kind of stock you want to buy, but it also says, hey, maybe this is a stock that's really going to, uh, you know, rally and, and become a big winner. And if you step back and look at the weekly chart, uh, it's been up to, I think, like almost 300% in the last two years. However, that run up was not a big soaring move. It's what I call a stair stepper. You know how they they go up a couple of weeks and then it pulls back. It pulls back to the 10 week line all the time. And I think the biggest moves it's had are maybe 30, sometimes, you know, it might touch 40%. So it's really a great candidate for taking 20% uh, or 25% profits. Yeah. And this was a stock that when it broke out of that cup with handle in uh, early January, it got up, it got up almost 25% and mm -hmm. then came back in. Uh, and and then got up a little bit higher, and, and then just took a little bit of a break. Actually, gapped down on earnings. Oh yeah, I mean, and, if you hadn't taken that twenty percent gain, 
it gapped down on earnings at like what like three weeks later or something yeah and i think at the low it was probably 13 percent above the buy point so you'd been 20 25 percent maybe even a little bit more uh i don't know where you sold it i, I had sold I, it i sold before wait, wait, before <laughs> that yeah <laughs> Yeah. I sold it for a loss on the on the, on the prior earnings report. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, this was a one gap down I didn't participate in. I oh. usually try to participate in most of them. <laughs> Got it. Well, I know had I been in that stock, I definitely would have been selling at the low that day. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so then, you know, even, uh, it, you know, it's gone back up. It had a great day today. It was up 6%. But mm -hmm. I can't imagine, I mean, for me, I know I cannot hold a stock like that through those ups and downs. But if you're taking profits at you know twenty percent, twenty five percent, it makes it a whole lot easier to you know handle your other parts of the portfolio. Because what happens, you know, you look at these stocks in isolation. It's like, well, it wasn't that bad. I could have uh, dealt with that. But you know, it's so often the case when one of them is falling, it means everything in your portfolio is falling. And that's when you start reacting emotionally and selling willy nilly. Yep. And if you've taken some of these profits, it makes it a whole lot easier to sit with the few that you really want to be with. So let's go to another example here, uh, Tandem Diabetes, mm -hmm. ticker symbol TNDM. And they make tiny wearable insulin pumps. And they're really, they're taking these insulin pumps and combining it with technology, right? right. And, the, and they have an app and it allows uh, people to monitor their glucose uh, through the app. And it's, it's revolutionary, I guess. I, I guess there, there aren't too many competitors in this field from what I understand right no. now. And that's why they wanted that monster run last year. And it was- yeah, I don't, from I don't, like I, two to 50 or yeah, something Yeah, it, like it was that. like a ridiculous run. Uh, and so they, they've set up, they set up a couple times, they set up a couple with handle, back uh, and broke out of it early this year and now they're forming another cup right and when they when they broke out of that first uh, couple cup with handle in february um you know it, it was moving up and was nice and then earnings came out and it gapped up and so by the end of the day if you had held through earnings you would have been up 34 percent now that's a great time to to take a profit but also you know, when you're gapping up out of earnings, it's like, well, maybe it's going to keep on going. Right. So something that we do, we've done this on leaderboard throughout the years, is once we hit that 20, 25% range, we look at the 10-day moving average and we'll hold the stock as long as it holds the 10-day moving average. So that's a fairly short moving average. You're not going to give back too much profit. Uh, in this case, I think with Tandem, you know, it it went up for another few weeks, and I think at the top it was probably you know in the mid forty percent range. Uh, so uh, when it undercut the ten day, so you you already had a great gain at thirty four percent. You added uh, you know another ten percentage points on top of that, and then got out. And it was a good time to get out because that stock started correcting a lot. That's true, and, and it corrected what thirty one percent and formed a new cup, and so potentially could give another opportunity, but a valuable lesson on why you want to take profits. And I think the big thing is it doesn't have to be all or none. Right. So you can slowly scale out of it on that earnings gap and take a little bit off because earnings gaps can run too and then hold some. And then once if it broke the 10 day moving average, you can take more and, you know, and just kind of massage your way out of it if, it, if it, the momentum slows down. So Chris, let's take a quick break. And when we return, we're going to go over one more example of profit taking. And then we'll move on to some current stocks that could be actionable. So stay tuned. Hey, everyone. It's Arusha from Investing with IBD here. Now, all the charts that we use uh, to do our analysis on the podcast, they are MarketSmith charts. And we're using pattern recognition. We see what stocks are breaking out. That's all automated. And we use the Girl 250 to find our ideas. If you want to take a trial, we have a great three-week trial for MarketSmith for $19.95. Go to Investors.com slash MS Podcast for all the details. And we're back with Chris Gessel on Investing with IBD. So let's go over one more stock that's a great example of why you want to take profits when you have the opportunity. And this stock is Shopify. And uh, ticker symbol is SHOP Shop. And now this is a stock we've talked about before, Chris. Mm -hmm. And just very briefly, they 
they're a platform that makes it easy for especially small and medium businesses to do e-commerce, right? And, and they kind of handle a lot of aspects of the operation. Yeah, it, it's not just making the sale and getting the money. There's uh, marketing and analytics and things like that. It's a uh, it's a, a very impressive platform. And it's and really it's not even just uh, mostly small medium, but there are some large businesses that use this platform too. One big company, and this is created by a self-made billionaire, is Kylie Cosmetics. And they're using Shopify to distribute all of their cosmetics to all those fans out there on Instagram Ky and Twitter and all this. Kylie, who would that be? You know, Ky you know, I I'm glad you're putting me on the spot here because I'm a huge fan of this show. But Kardashians, keeping up with the Kardashians, Kylie Jenner, the okay. youngest, uh, the youngest member of the family. Are you wearing some Kylie cosmetics? Right <laughs> I now? always, I okay. always, you know, uh, uh, for especially for the camera Got that it. you can watch. If you want to watch a video version and see me wearing Kylie cosmetics, go to investors.com/podcast. <laughs> But let's go into the, the earnings, Chris. Yeah, well, the uh, earnings have been accelerating. You know, when it first broke out more than a year ago, it was just turning profitable before it turned profitable. Now the profits have really started coming in. And uh, I think it, it was uh, earnings accelerated to 125% in the latest quarter. That just was reported uh, last week. So this is a stock that we had on leaderboard. And we decided, um, you know, it had hit the 20% the, the profit zone before earnings. It had also just cleared a little consolidation. So it had been going sideways for a week or two and then started moving ahead, ahead of earnings. So we decided, you know, we've hit the 20% profit zone. It's, it's running up. Let's just uh, hold it, you know, and see if it holds the 10-day like we talked about. So, uh it was doing well, and then I guess maybe two weeks later, it's it's earnings time, and this thing is up nicely. I mean, well more than than twenty percent. I think it was. Uh, I think when we decided to cash it in, it was up twenty eight percent the day before earnings. So uh, we were feeling like this is a good profit to uh, to book, especially because we had gotten hit with a few surprises, like uh, the the worst one was Xilinx. That was one on leaderboard. Yep. Do you know that one? Unfortunately, I do. I know okay. it a little too well. <laughs> okay. Well, anyhow, that was you know that was part of our mindset that we got to book this thing because you know it doesn't make sense to uh, switch it into an option trade at that point because it's extended and because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's extended it could pull back even if the earnings are good. Well, the earnings were great, and like I said, they accelerated probably some of the best growth in a long time that they've had. And uh, and now it's well above the twenty percent um, uh, profit zone. Again, if you hadn't taken any profits uh, along the way or taken some profits, I mean, I, I think uh, selling on the gap you could have you know justified as a good thing, especially with it being so extended. But if you wanted to let it go a little bit more, which is kind of how I always say, can I get a yeah. little bit more? Yeah. Uh, you know, just look and see. Uh, you know, does it hold the 10 day? I think the interesting thing, the 10 day is still, it's still above it. Exactly. It's not Very close, yep. but it gapped up and then it went up again and again and made another little tiny gain. And even with the market pulling back, it's held those gains. But when you step back and look at the chart, you know, it's, it was going up at a pretty good clip. And all of a sudden that angle of attack, that angle of ascent, is now even steeper. It looks like it's going vertical. Yeah, yeah so exactly. So when you see vertical moves like that, that always makes me a little nervous. And so if you know, if you haven't taken profits, I would say this is probably a good time to at least take some partial profits because, sure, this this stock may go up a hundred percent this year, maybe more. But when you see a move like that, it it typically means there's a consolidation coming. No no stock goes straight up. Uh, forever. Yeah, unfortunately. But yeah, I've learned the hard way for, for <laughs> this one because we this th this is the time when they go up vertical like that, that you're like, hey, you know, may maybe I'll be able to get a yacht one day. Yeah. Right? And, and so that that's kind of the signal. Okay, time to sell something uh, for the stock. Okay, Chris, let's go into some current stocks here. And the first stock we have on our list is Broadcom, mm -hmm. uh, ticker symbol AVGO. And these, I, I just want to say it it still bugs me that they didn't change the ticker symbol when Avago and Broadcom 
merged and they took Avago's ticker yeah. symbol I, and Broadcom. And so I just call it Avago. Me all too. The time. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, and uh, yeah, it, it is kind of strange because Broadcom was the bigger yeah. name too. Uh, but uh, I think maybe Avago bought Broadcom. Maybe mm -hmm. is that how it, maybe they were, I don't know. But, I don't know what it is, but it's the weirdest thing yeah. where they take one ticker and one name and they don't match. And, and so these guys are one of the largest chip designers out there. And they are in many industries. One of the, the key industries, and this is something that we've spoken about before, is 5G. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, could be a, this is going to be a big driver uh, for, for their business, uh, for their wireless chips. Uh, and uh, I think one thing for this one, since a lot of the 5G phones are going to come out in 2020, that that's where you're going to really start seeing the growth for Broadcom and a lot of other 5G guys, but especially for Broadcom since they're making the wireless chips and those are what's going to go into the mobile phone. Yeah, and you see that in the estimates. They're supposed to, I mean, I think the the earnings in the last quarter were in the, the single digits, or at least the sales were in the single digits, and they're supposed to accelerate into the mid-20% range over the next three quarters. So that, I mean, that's pretty good growth for a company of that size. Yeah. And the, you know the other thing is they're a diversified chip maker. They're not just 5G. They're in all sorts of different markets. And I know that that's part of their plan to, to diversify so they're not such a boom and bust type chip company, which is good. And it's, you know, it's big cap. Uh, it's not going to be one that, that you know, races up 40 or 50% in a few weeks. But you know, if you've got the patience for it, uh, it's made some good moves and continues to set up. So, uh, but is it offering any entry point right now? Uh, let's let's pull it up, AVGO, and it's really coming down to the 50-day moving average or the 10-week mm -hmm. moving average. So they they, they uh, really broke out of a, a kind of a large trading range that this stock on earnings. So it's they they had, had they, they reported earnings, mm -hmm. gave that guidance, market liked it, gaps up. And it's just been, as you said, because there are larger stocks slowly and methodically moving up. Now with this market pullback, here it's coming back and really kind of an orderly pullback, a normal pullback, the type of pullback you want to see, right? Right. Not all just all of, the volume on the on the pullback has been below average. So. Yeah. So so a perfect kind of pullback right here, and especially when you look on the the weekly chart, mm -hmm. it is only 06 percent above the 10 week line right now. So yeah, it's so right there in that yeah, zone. Yeah, probably a dollar or two above it. So I think at this point if you're watching it and and are interested in a stock like this that uh you know look for some uh nice volume on a reversal, especially if the market is turning higher and it looks like we're done with the uh the trade fears at least for a week for, or for two. Now, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Chris, let's go to our second current stock, and this company's TradeWeb, and their ticker symbol is TW, and they're in a very interesting business. Uh, they're in the bond and fixed income business, and, and it's kind of mind-boggling, but you know, we take electronic trading for granted with stocks, mm -hmm. but that's not the case for bond and fixed incomes. There, a lot of them are uh, these big institutions. They're, they're still trading on the phone. <laughs> they're calling up each other and they're 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 doing their thing on the phone and and making the trades this way. Still the 1980s. I know. Yeah, you just like TV, just like those movies you see, right? <laughs> they, that's still happening. Uh, and and so TradeWeb is one of the leaders that they're providing software, a platform uh, to make electronic trades. Now they're not the first one to to get in this. The other competitor is uh, and and this is a company that's done well over the last few years uh, market access oh yeah definitely know that one we had that on swing trader a number of times and made some really good profits off of it yeah so so here's here's trade web they're uh, doing well and, and I think the big thing here is with the bond and fixed income business just like any of these uh, markets that haven't adopted yet technology this market is ripe for disruption and so let's let's go into this. This is a a four week IPO base, and they have good earnings and sales. One of those few IPOs that have yeah. good earnings and sales. Uh, one of the keys here is that uh, they're they're set to report tomorrow. So you 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 want to keep that in mind to see the reaction. 
Uh, but they're they're setting up. They they only came out uh, maybe uh, last month, um, but it's been acting well. And you, uh, if you're looking on MarketSmith, you're seeing that pattern recognition forming for the IPO base. Yeah, the thing I really like about it, well, not only just the look of the IPO base, it was up two weeks uh, strongly, and then started pulling back. And all those weeks have been pretty, you know, pretty orderly. Volumes been uh, declining in the pullback, so that's that's a good sign. But what I really like about the company is the accelerating sales growth, and so it's been you know accelerating for over a year. And in the last uh, uh, quarter, they reported, I guess before they were a public company, they said fifty six percent growth in in sales. So that's been one of the key elements of. The, the IPOs that really move that are tradable, maybe they don't turn into, you know, prolonged winners, but you can pick up some really good profits quickly in these, in these, especially in this market right now. So anytime you see earn, uh, sales growth that's, you know, well north of 30%, that definitely catches my eye. I put all those on my watch list and uh, keep an eye on them. So this one could be actionable over the... Really, I have to let's, let's see how they react to earnings. It could be actionable right. uh, after that. Maybe break out of this IPO base. So it's it's definitely one you want to do some research, keep it on your watch list, and then let the market tell you whether it's viable or not. So, Chris, we wanted to do a couple of updates on a couple of other mm-hmm. current stocks. And uh, Mike and I, in last week's episode, we spoke about this stock, uh, Zoom ticker symbol ZM, and uh, that's been acting pretty well we're getting a little more volatile with with the with, <laughs> yeah, with the definitely. market uh but uh, it, it is acting now it didn't really form an official ipo base with the pattern recognition on market smith but uh it, just kind of a shorter term ipo base we, we spoke about it closed at 77.68 today right and it had been up over 80 so it's it you know pulled back a lot on tuesday and then uh, rebounded today, so that was nice to see. So this is still one that, if you miss that that initial buy point, and really this was a, you know, about the shortest IPO base you can get. I think it was five days. Right. And uh, you know, sometimes they, they work, sometimes they don't. But this is one I think is still worth watching because Zoom, again, another product that we use at IBD, we're well aware of it. Uh, it's driving all of our conference rooms. There was a little bit of a learning curve, but now uh, at least I, I know how to use it. It's pretty slick. Yeah, yeah. It, it works on every uh, computer. Uh, you can easily just uh, show show your screen. Right. And so they've got, I mean, they're just turning profitable. They've been showing penny profits the last couple quarters, and uh, but they've got triple digit uh, sales growth. So again, it's that kind of sales growth, even when they don't have, you know, full, you know, well-established profits that I really key on and I pay a lot of attention to. And, and you know, this one has been on my watch list. Uh, it's on leaderboard. The, we stuck with it on leaderboard. Um, I got shaken out yesterday. How about you? Well, I, I do have some shares of this, a small amount, because mm-hmm. it was it's such a small IPO base. Right. But I do like the company and I do like the software, so I wanted to get some kind of placeholder Take a taste. in the portfolio. Exactly. Uh, and then we have one more uh, stock that uh, you wanted to speak about, Chris. Uh, Pager Duty, ticker yeah, Pager, symbol PD. Right. Pager Duty is another one of these new IPOs making a, a, a base. It hasn't, um, you know, it, it broke out nicely uh, last week. And again, very short base one, two, three, four, even five. Yeah, I guess yeah, there's really, really small right. consolidation or trading range. Right. A small uh, base and then has run up nicely. So it broke out around 43 or something like that. And it hit 50 uh, the last two days. So even then, you know, in this market, you might want to take some uh, take some profits on this. Uh, it'll probably make another IPO base at this point. So I would definitely keep this one on on the watch list. Yeah, and uh, it, it's good to see that pagers are coming back. You know, I've missed <laughs> the pagers. No, but what these guys do, they, they, they're, 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 they're analyzing a lot of data, right? All these computers, all the servers are collecting data. And if there's an error in some software, they notify the right people for that immediately. So kind of like a pager 
right. kind of, you know, don't, I, don't you miss those pictures? <laughs> but uh, and they're using uh, AI and machine learning, so they're, they're uh, definitely innovating on on their end there. Uh, so uh, so keep an eye on these stocks. They're even though it's volatile. Remember when the market pulls back, that pro- that's going to provide opportunity, especially for those stocks that you might have missed. And then we've had a number of IPOs uh, setting up. Now, after the break, we're going to have uh, Randy Watts back with another sponsored interview. So you definitely don't want to miss this one. Hi there. This is Randy Watts, Chief Investment Strategist of William O'Neill. I'd like to welcome everyone back to our second interview in the Investing with IBD uh, podcast with Alliance Bernstein. Uh, today, we get to welcome uh, Rick Brink, who's the Chief Market Strategist for Alliance Bernstein. And Thanks for coming by. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, uh, Rick, I thought maybe we could start out with uh, your thoughts on where we are in the current economic cycle. Well, stop me if you've heard this one before. We're uh, probably later in the cycle. Uh, late, later, um, you know, the typical indicators of labor being the engine, but labor moderating, growth moderating. Uh, we have forecasts that are similar that speak to the idea that economic growth through 2019 will become more moderate in the developed world. And again, in 2020, modestly so, over those two years. Uh, But, you know, as a New York Yankees fan, uh, if you've been to a Yankees-Red Sox game, you know that the late innings can go for about six days. So the idea is that the expansion can certainly continue, but just at a lower rate. And and market returns would obviously correspond to that. And and what are the kind of characteristics for, for our listeners? What are the kind of characteristics that you would associate with being late cycle in terms of an economic indicators. Yeah, so so again, I mean, the first thing for us, especially because it's been so important, is, is what's happening with labor dynamics and growth in jobs, wage gains, and the, the trend in that space. Uh, and then just historically tightening financial conditions. And that's that's really such a major part of the discussion today because of what we've done from a monetary policy perspective for so long. And it's why it's so uh, front in market investors' minds and participants' minds. Um, I, I described 2018 as sort of Godzilla versus King Kong because it was the removal or the fast-tracking of the removal of the largest monetary policy stimulus in world history, arguably, uh, with what the U.S. was doing, juxtaposed against the introduction of late-cycle fiscal stimulus. And so who would win out, especially since in 2017, in anticipation of that going through, we'd seen so much market gains anyway. And so uh, it, it wasn't surprising in many respects that if you look back in 2018, uh, it was a pretty simple narrative in retrospect, which is any time that the market had to come around to the Fed's way of thinking and the Fed's way was tighter, the market ate itself, right. throw in some global trade issues at the same time. And that really sort of defined the entirety of the movements of the year. So that's, that's very interesting. Now, I know you've also done a lot of work on these longer thematic super cycles the kind of long, slow waves of boom and bust of mm-hmm. economies. You know, what are your thoughts on on where the U.S. is right now on on that? Oh, well, first of all, when you're a student of economic history, you spend a lot of time sitting alone at bars um, <laughs> with a lot of nervous people sitting on the other end asking for the checks. Um, but I think it's really important here because uh, I I look at the world in chapters of time, and probably one of the most important dates. Um, really for us in our careers, for most people that literally work on Wall Street today and in any part of the financial sector around the world, is 1981. Uh, you, you probably had the most potent cocktail, and I'll put an asterisk there because arguably it's within two years north or south of that, but you had four of the most potent ingredients to the most incredible fundamental cocktail in U.S. history, maybe modern financial history. And so if we count it down, the first thing is you get the oldest baby boomer entering their peak earning years in 1981. So that's obviously going to create a massive demographic, and one of the first ingredients of growth is people. Um, so there's sure. our first one. The, the second thing that's going to – and that's going to – by the way, for the next 20 years, of course, because of the size or the length of that demographic in years, that's going to happen for two decades until we reach – you know, peak number of mm-hmm. peak earning uh, uh, employees in the labor force. The second thing you're going to get is you're going to start from this incredibly high level of base rates. Fed funds rate 18 to 20 percent at that time. That baby boomer doesn't know it, but they're going to ride 20 years of declining rates, inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And obviously, that's a massive driver of valuation, market returns, real estate equities, et cetera, bond returns, everything. Um, The third is going to be massive globalization. So uh, December of last year was the 40-year anniversary of Deng Xiaoping's four modernization speech. So that's the beginnings of China as the world's factory floor, and that's going to take root, and then ultimately its ascension into WTO many years later. 
And then finally, you're going to get the digital age launching in 1983. And I, I often just, for simplicity's sake, think of it as uh, Microsoft Office meets the Internet. Um, and when you put all of that, any one of those would have been incredibly powerful fundamentally. But they all trigger together and they feed on each other. And so you get this incredible fundamental gain. You real wage gains, productivity gains, market returns are incredible. Uh, and all of that is as natural as natural can be, but it also runs its course. Eventually, you get to a point down the line about 20 years later where inflation has made its way down to where we want it to be. Rates have come down. That oldest baby boomer starts to exit their peak earning years. A lot of those gains have basically accrued. And then what happens next after that? And this is where I think it gets so important is somewhere in there, we go from that fundamental driver to more or less manufacturing our returns. And probably the easiest way to think about that is to look at a ratio of uh, household net worth to GDP over time. And it stays within a range literally decades after the end of World War II. It's, it's around that time that it spikes out of that range. We get the tech bubble. It spikes yet higher, and we get the financial crisis. And finally, it spikes higher again with the post-financial crisis response. And that's really where I think a lot of portfolio construction emanates from is what happens on the other side of what I call the extended super cycle. Well, our, you know, our, our listeners are very interested in how they can grow their own household <laughs> uh, net worth. Uh, you know, given the setup right now of, of low rates, uh, you know, there's not a ton of inflation in the, in the U.S. economy. Uh, uh, people are, you know, a little worried about slowing earnings and slowing, slowing GDP here in the U.S. You know, wh what are you saying right now to people about how they should asset allocate their own personal portfolios? Mm -hmm. Well, philosophically, this gets to be a little bit different than maybe what we've done for a long time. And that's the, the first thing I believe is that portfolio success over the next 10 years or so is probably going to be less about trying to optimize the level of return, seeking the highest level of returns we can find in a market where I don't think high returns are necessarily there to be had. And uh, risks are certainly you know, everywhere for us. Um, I think it's more about focusing on the path of returns, the sequence of returns. And, and again, I know this sounds like you know, reading through IKEA furniture instructions, but it's, it's basically the benefits you accrue from finding alpha in the path, getting more of a market's upside than its downside. And as technical as it might sound, it has several benefits, the first of which is um, that it allows you to protect more strongly to the downside. Uh, secondly, it allows you to match your own personal comfort with how markets undulate to the path you set for yourself. Um, and lastly, that I think it's particularly important today because the last element of this is those baby boomers are now making their way through the retirement years. And one of the things that we know is when you're right around the age of 65, it's in that window that you're most exposed to a significant drawdown that nukes your spend down plan. Sure. So have a major drawdown right now, and it's going to cost you 10 years in retirement, which means your plan is dead. And so the other benefit of sort of this sequence of return investing is it allows you to walk through that sensitive area of time and not experience necessarily uh, the significant drawdown that would eventually, you know, impair and kill that retirement. Uh you know, one thing I hear a lot about, uh, given that many people do view that we're later in the in the in the cycle, and, and you've talked about both the economic cycle and the and the, the more the larger super cycle, is is that they should be emphasizing quality, mm -hmm. both in terms of the kind of stocks they they buy, in terms of the kind of bonds they buy. You know, really buying the best of the best. Uh, what what is your advice on that for our listeners, and how do you define quality? Okay, very fair. Okay, so. Um, Let's, um, let's step into the notion of, of uh, this broader idea, then we'll come into quality, which is um, I believe we're at the point in the cycle where um, we shouldn't be focusing on home run potential companies. We be, should be focused on persistent singles and doubles hitters, um, high average guys. I mean, somewhere along the way, we, we lost sight of the value of Ted Williams or Rod Carew or Derek Jeter. Uh, and I'm surprised you mentioned uh, Ted Williams, given your your Yankee bias. You know what? You, ha <laughs> you have to respect greatness. You have to respect greatness. Um, and um, you know, I I think that uh, from the perspective of uh, equity pricing today, factor pricing, strangely enough, many of these types of factors are on sale. So quality in terms of balance sheet, low levels of leverage, free uh, free cash flow, yield generation. Um, all of that is 
Uh, today, free cash flow yield is at among its lowest pricing levels ever at a price to book and a price price to earnings basis um, uh, in the United States and even more acute in Europe. Hmm. Um, and so this notion, uh, and by the way, these quality and 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 everything, uh, low volatility, another area uh, that's underpriced relative to other areas of the market, um, all of them are awfully strong across an entirety of a cycle. If you just graph them out across everything, but thank you very much. They're really potent late cycle. Uh, they tend to participate well in the up markets. They're not going to get the, the full breadth, but they're going to be pretty close. But again, should you have a downturn, which we're not expecting, but should you get one, they tend to be uh, really strong at defending the downside. How do you think about active versus passive right now for investors? And, and you know, should be individuals be trying to construct their own portfolios with individual stocks versus buying a, b- buying an index or an ETF? Well, we should uh, we should save this for another podcast. Uh, that is, you're, you know, it is um, it is an incredible debate today between the use of active versus passive. Cut to the chase. I, I believe portfolios incorporate both. There there are areas of the markets where alpha potential tends to be greater. You could define it as initial earnings estimates versus final actual earnings um, uh, generated. And where you find the greatest dispersion there tends to produce the greatest alpha potential. Now, the ability of a manager to capture it or not is another discussion. But there are definitely areas of the markets historically where more alpha is generated than others. Um, But if I, I back it up a bit, I just mentioned the the, sort of anomalies to earnings generation created by the last decade. Another one was when central banks turn out to be the world's greatest hedge funds, um, and they are the ones that are able to generate returns with no downside, um, they start to magnify one of nature's uh, less spoken about rules as it relates to investing, which is when you have lower levels of volatility, you tend to have stronger market returns. And when you have stronger market returns and lower volatility, you tend to have much lower dispersion of returns within that equity universe. And so during the beta trade, this was the lowest level of dispersion in at least 40 years. And I say that because that's just as far back as we went and not by a little bit, but by a long, long, long shot. And And, so by the beta trade, you really mean all of the coordinated global easings after the financial crisis in in 2008 to 2010. Absolutely. Which drives, you know, we we talked, we opened with the 1981 period forward. The S&P 500 averaged 17 and change percent for nearly two decades. And it did so on a great set of fundamental drivers we spoke about. Um, interestingly enough, the latter decade was also 17 and change percent, but with a completely different makeup of what drove that performance. And so you're right. This was a period of, inc- as we all know, tremendous returns, but incredibly low volatility. Drawdowns were so infrequent that this idea of even down capture investing seems almost silly. If there's no down capture to capture, then you just ride the wave. Um, and so on the other side of all of that, you know, uh, the notion is, is as volatility rises, as we don't have all of that coordinated support, we're sort of on our own. And it becomes a growth story again, and then it becomes an idiosyncratic story. Um, and so I do believe that uh, as we continue forward, you're going to see more and more dispersion. The opportunity for uh, performance from an active perspective is real. And one thing I'll say as a sidebar is um, the benefits of ETFs are incredibly, uh, you know, incredibly obvious from an access perspective, a pricing perspective, I think has been tremendous for markets. The one thing that I would caution uh, listeners about is that um, you cannot have so much money going into the same things at the same time in the same weights for a decade and not start to create anomalies inside of the market. Uh, You start to see uh, uh, intracorrelations rise amongst the most crowded trades, and the most crowded trades tend to get driven more by passive investing now because he who has the money creates the crowded trades. Um, And then the least crowded sort of break into their own camp of Hatfields and McCoys. from a um, from an it, if you imagine a world where let's say you were the very last active manager alive and everybody else and that that could be a few, in a few years it right? could be in a few <laughs> years I'm going to call you and see how it's going uh, it, you know and, and you're the last one but everyone else in the world uh, bought passively how would you ever generate alpha I mean if you think about it conceptually now let's pretend you're not a massive enough investor to move the markets you're just somebody trying to pick a winner and. Um, imagining a world where almost all market weights are locked in because all money goes into passive instruments at the weights that they were in the index when you start it, um, how does that last active manager uh, win? How does that last active manager standing win? And it might change the way that you recognize alpha, but if the argument up until now, um, an argument was put forth some time ago, 
is that the more skilled participants that entered the market starting in the 80s and booming forward remove the amount of alpha available per person, then you sort of have to argue that the opposite is true eventually, that as more and more of the market goes conceptually to bulk-based buying, um, a couple of things are going are to happen. There's more opportunity to generate fundamental winners. And the things that end up being overweights in market won't, and markets won't come from the same place. So, for example, if there were two ETFs in the world, the S&P 500 and, and tech, and you put those two guys together, there are going to be stocks that show up in both and stocks that show up in one or the other. By definition, if you show up in both, you're going to get more money. You're going to be an accidental overweight. Now, we don't have two ETFs in the world. We have 2,000. Right. So when all 2,000 go together, being able to track literally which stocks weren't chosen to be overweights but accidentally ended up appearing in the most ETFs that got the most flows in a given month, they start to become the overweights and the underweights in a market. I think that that's fascinating. But the underpinning notion of you know these investments that we can choose, whether actively or passively, that get us a little bit more of a market's up than it's down are really the major driver, I think, for portfolios. So one, one question there. It sounds like you're telling clients right now that you think there'll be more volatility going forward than we've had the last few years. I, I, yes, I do. I do. And, and the thing is, is, you know, I like to think about portfolio construction almost in, in terms of an insurance policy. So um, it may or may not happen. But if I can take out uh, a policy or some level of downside protection at the lowest possible premium and I can try to minimize the cost of that defense, then it's worth taking that out even if, even if it doesn't happen. I've always said that the hardest thing to take credit for as a portfolio manager is a thing that you defend that never comes to pass. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't have taken the defense in the first place. And so um, the idea of these natural betas that do this um, is exactly that. It's you want to participate. You don't want to give up too much of the market. If I really thought that markets were just going to turn down and I felt that strongly, I'd be advising a lower bait in the portfolio, taking cash positions. But I know that the likelihood is, as we started this, the cycle can extend for some time. Markets could be solid if unspectacular. And we have a lot of baby boomers in the world that need to participate in that market. But at the same time, they can't afford the downturn. So it's really the balance between two as opposed to the ability to choose one or the other. And so if I, if I might, um, one of the other great betas, I'll stay with the high yield side, with the fixed income side, but with what I think of as an equity de-risking beta, which is high yield. High yield is a Swiss army knife of betas. It is incredibly powerful in portfolios. But this is something that gets 60-something percent of the upside of equities over time with about 40 percent of the downside. Not very persistent. It changes over time. But um, let's say that I told you that I thought the S&P 500 would return about 6 percent a year over the next five years, which is roughly what I've got in my head. And I told you that the U.S. high yield, high yield to worst, came into this quarter at about 6.4 percent. And then I also told you that the Yield to worst with striking accuracy as you enter any starting point, I could make a beer bet and win this over and over again, is the forward five-year return in high yield is almost exactly going to match that yield to worst. And whether you're at the, at when spreads are wide, when spreads are tight, if you missed the rally, if you caught it before the rally, it doesn't tend to matter. And for, again, for fundamental and structural reasons. And so, if there's such a high predictive ability of yield to worst, now the five years, by the way, is for a reason. Most high yield bonds issued for 10 year maturity, non callable for five, and most companies call, and so you recycle the whole market every five years or so. So the life cycle of a bond runs at five. And so you end up with an, an incredibly high likelihood that your yield to worst is your return. So if I said high yield has, is starting out with a higher yield than what I think the return of the SP 500 will be over the next five years, but it tends to have 40% of the drawdown, and its max drawdown versus equities is 65. Back again to the notion, isn't that an interesting way to de-risk, to participate nearly fully versus an equity market but with much greater drawdown protection? In that instance, I think the cost of my premium is very, very low. Well, uh, Rick, I'd really like to thank you for coming, coming by. Uh, uh, this is uh, Randy Watts for Investing with IBD. Again, I'm the chief uh, investment strategist of William O'Neill, and we had Rick Brink here. He's the chief market strategist of Alliance Bernstein, mm -hmm. and we, we appreciate your time, and we look forward to the next in this series of podcasts with Alliance Bernstein. Thanks well, a lot, Rick. Sure. Thanks for having me. Okay, so that's it for this week's episode of Investing with IBD. Thanks, Chris, for joining us once again. I hope you'll have me back. We're going to have to see. Next week, we will have Mark Minervini, a successful growth investor, 
a big Market Smiths fan, and also a market wizard. He's going to be on the podcast, and we're going to discuss his thoughts on this current market and why this market could go even further. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Arusha Pierce. I'm we'll Chris Gessel. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Well, maybe not Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and for this week's Milton Charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.